Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Mark Podolsky. Mark Podolsky is the owner of Frontier Properties, a land investment company. Mark, also known as the Land Geek, is widely considered the country's most trusted and foremost authority on buying and selling raw, undeveloped land within the United States. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. How are you today? Kendall, pulse is normal. Respiration's fine. Thanks so much for having me. That's a great start. Great start to the interview. So glad to have you. I've wanted to have you on the podcast for quite some time now. So let's just jump right in. Tell us, how did you get started in doing land deals? So if we rewind the tape to 2000, I was a miserable, micromanaged, 45-minute commute to work and back investment banker specializing in mergers and acquisitions with private equity groups. And Kendall, it got so bad for me. I wouldn't get the Sunday blues anticipating Monday coming around. I'd have to get the Friday blues anticipating the weekend going by really fast and having to be back at work on Monday. Wow. So my firm hires this guy and he's telling me that as a side hustle, he's buying up raw land, pennies on the dollar at tax deed auctions. He's flipping them online and he's making a 300% return on his investment. And I'm looking at companies all day long and a great company, great, has 15% EBITDA margins or free cash flow. Average companies, 10%. I'm looking at companies all day long, less than 10%. So of course, I don't believe him. I've got three grand saved up for car repairs. I go to New Mexico with him. I do exactly what he tells me to do. I buy 10 half acre parcels, an average price of $300 each. I flip them online. They all sell for an average price of $1,200 each, 300% it worked. So I took all that money. I went to another auction in Arizona, which is where I live. And again, this is 2000. There's no one in the room. And I'm buying up lots and acreage for nothing. I sold all that land. I made over $90,000 cash. So I go to my wife and she's pregnant. I said, honey, I'm going to quit my job and become a full-time land investor. And she said, absolutely not. So I, said, <laughs> so I said, okay. So it took 18 months for the land investing income to exceed the investment banking income. I've been doing it full-time ever since. I've done over 6,000 transactions and I absolutely love it. That is remarkable. So when you first got started, talk to us a little bit about, you mentioned that you had someone that kind of introduced you into the land space, but did you have any types of other mentors or coaches? How did you learn the land game? No one knew what we were doing. We were all starting it together and it was just new. We had no idea what we were doing. And so I've made millions of dollars worth of mistakes. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I learned the hard way. Like there was, there was no communities like there is today. Like we were just talking before the podcast, like even just five years ago, no one even heard of raw land investing. Like you couldn't think of a more boring niche. When you go on the HGTV or the DIY network, there's no flip, flip land. Flip the four pictures raw land, the after pictures raw land. It's like boring. It's exciting days now that there's so much community and support in this, what I think is the best passive income model. Yeah. So what do you contribute to to land ramping up in popularity like it has in the last five years? I think that I don't know. This is I'm just guessing because I don't go to RIA meetings or any of those things, but I suspect that as the economy has been very hot in real estate for so long, it's just gotten more and more competitive in traditional real estate. And now as interest rates have crept up and there's people out like me with a podcast and other folks like you talking about it, if you're in that space and you're competing and your margins are shrinking, you're dealing with the tenants and the toilets and the termites, you're like, wait a second, these guys and gals are doing really well and they don't have to deal with any of the headaches. And it's less competitive. Absolutely. Why no, not? Can, Why not? Yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. When I first got my start, it was in wholesaling houses. And the minute that I did my very first land deal, I did those houses for eight years. And when I did my very first land deal and realized how so much of the friction that I was used to in these transactions was just removed by not dealing with any type of structures on the property. I was sold. <laughs> I'm never touching another house again. So I definitely get that that ease and simplicity of the land business. Yeah, no, absolutely. absolutely. So 
what types of land deals do you specialize in currently? Yeah, let me walk you through the model. So, yeah. Kendall, where, where do you live? I live in Austin, Texas. Oh, okay. You've lost all complaining privileges. <laughs> but let's assume that you own five acres of raw land where I live in Arizona, okay? And you owe $200 in back taxes. So you're advertising two important things to me. Number one, you have no emotional attachment to the raw land. You're in Texas. The property is in Arizona. And number two, you're distressed financially in some weird way. Because when we don't pay our property taxes, we don't value it in the same way as someone who is current on their taxes. And as a result, the county treasurer keeps sending you notices saying, Kendall, if you don't pay your property taxes, you're going to lose that property to a tax deed or a tax lien investor. So all I do is look at the comparable sales, let's say on your five acre parcel for the last 12 to 18 months. I'm going to take the lowest comparable sale. Let's say it's $10,000 and divide by four. And that's going to get me what Warren Buffett would call a 300% margin of safety. So I'm going to send you an actual offer of $2,500. Now you accept it. Why? Because for you, $2,500 is better than nothing. In reality, three to 5% of people are going to accept my quote unquote top dollar offer. But now that you've accepted it, I'm going to go through due diligence or in-depth research. I have to confirm you still own the property. I have to confirm that back taxes are only $200. I want to make sure that there's been no breaks in the chain of title, no liens or encumbrances. So I have this whole property checklist. Now, because it's $5,000 or less, I'm going to outsource that due diligence to my team in Jamaica. It costs about $11 and they're connected to an American title company. If it was more than $5,000, I'd take no title risk and I would just close traditionally through a title company. But in this case, it's only $2,500. We'll assume everything checks out. So I send you a check for $2,300. I send the treasurer a check for $200. I own it free and clear. And now, Kendall, I'm going to flip it 30 days or less and make it cash flow like a rental home. So, Kendall, I have a built-in best buyer. Do you know who it is? Who is it? Does any, anybody on the call know? Anyone would put it in the chat? Kendall, I, I hate putting you on the spot like this. Oh, I'm just, I thought it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> oh, Brad. so Brad knows. It's the neighbors. So I'm going to send out neighbor letters saying, hey, here's your opportunity. Protect your privacy. Protect your views. Know your neighbor. So oftentimes the neighbors will purchase. If they pass, I'll go to my buyer's list. If the buyer's list passes, I'll go to a little website you may have never heard of. It's called Craigslist. It's the 15th most trafficked website in the United States. I'll go to one I know you've heard of called Meta or Facebook buy sell groups in the marketplace. And then I'm going to go to the lands, land.com, landmoto.com, landfarm.com, landsofamerica.com, landcentury.com, landflip.com, landhub.com. These are platforms where people buy and sell raw land. But the secret is I'm going to make it irresistible for my buyer. So all I'm going to ask for is a $2,500 down payment to secure that five-acre parcel. And then I'll make it a car payment. Let's say one ninety-seven a month, 9% interest for the next 72 months. So it's a one-time sale. I'm going to get my capital out on the down payment. I could go six to 10 months out. And then I'm getting one ninety-seven a month for the next 72 months and 9% interest no renters, no rehabs, no renovations, no rodents. And because we're not dealing with a tenant, we're exempt from Dodd-Frank, RESPA, and the SAFE Act, all this owner's real estate legislation. So it's a simple game. Can we create enough passive income and enough land notes where our passive income exceeds our fixed expenses? And then we're working because we want to, not because we have to. Excellent. Love that. So you're creating cash flow using these lots. Are these typically, can you talk about the criteria that you look for in terms of, is there a particular size range that you like? Is there, is it rural? Is it infill? Is it all of it? What, what do you look for when you're looking for these types of properties to do this business model with? Yeah, I'd say that when we're doing our research, we're looking at areas an hour to three hours from the nearest city, infill lots, I'm not going to get a great deal, 25, 30 cents on the dollar on an infill lot. Let's say, for example, in Austin, right? If I get an infill lot in Austin, I'm going the biggest, baddest land broker in town. I'll get 125 cents on the dollar for that deal. So I want to go into these inefficient markets where nobody really knows the value of their land, essentially. 
And so then we're just, it's just a numbers game. We're just going to make offers and we're going to make our money on the buy. So I think that's one criteria. The other is when we're doing our county research, nobody wakes up and thinks to themselves, boy, I like some raw land today in Iowa, unless you live in Iowa. So we want to focus on the fast growing states, the sunshine states, Texas, Arizona, Nevada, California, New Mexico, Colorado, uh, you know, maybe a little bit in the Northwest, Oregon, Washington, Florida, beautiful areas in the Midwest as well. There's millions and millions of acres of raw land. They're inexpensive. And we're taking advantage of that inefficient market where nobody really knows. Excellent. And so if someone's listening to this, they're brand new into the land space and they say, that that sounds really good. I understand the idea of these inefficient markets, but what are some key factors that I can look for to determine if a market is inefficient? What would you tell them? If I'm a newbie and I don't even know where to begin, I would just, for lack of a bad, better word, Samsung it, right? So the iPhone comes out and then Samsung comes out and copies the iPhone. So I would look, where are the Brad DeGraws buying? Where's Kendall buying? Where's Mark buying, right? Because these guys have been doing it longer than me. I'd start there. But before I would start there, I'd also start with, what's my budget? So I need to know my budget. I would say that I want to look, be able to buy at least five to seven properties in the beginning. I don't want to you know, spend my whole budget on one property. So I would say that's really going to be, if I'm a total newbie to this game, besides getting educated, I'd say go to where the other land investors are on a site like landmoto.com. Definitively, there's a market there. Let guys like you and me discover new markets and spend the money and take the risk. That's really good. And so, again, brand new persons listening to this and they say, okay, I, I'm feeling good about this. I like this model. I'm wrapping my head around it. But I don't have any money. What do you say to those people? Can people with no money actually get started and get some traction in this business? What's funny on the Art of Passive Income podcast, we, we do these roundtable podcasts. And this is one of the questions we'd asked. And I started with $3,000. I have a buddy who started with $800. We think you can get a deal for $500. There's also something called land arbitrage. So let's say, for example, I sold Brad a parcel for 10 grand, right? And my cost basis was 2,500. And he puts $2,500 down. He's making payments for 197 a month. He makes six payments. And next thing he loses his job, he defaults, right? So now I'm in a profit. I could then go to somebody who is new to the land business and say, hey, look, this is the market, right? You can get $500 down, $197 a month on this property. I'm going to sell it to you for $250 down and $97 a month. So you're going to make the spread, right? So for just $250, bucks, they can lock up that $10,000 parcel, buy themselves a few months of marketing and test it and see if they can sell it. If they can't sell it, they can give it back. And in that way, they can really control land without having to have a lot of capital. The other method I would do, and I've seen some of my students do this, is they'll send out mailers, right? Let's say you got $500 for mailers. And Audrey here raises her hand and says, yeah, I'll sell my land for $30,000. Well, you don't have $30,000 to pay Audrey. So no problem. I have enough money to mail the neighbors, right? So now I'm sending out the neighbor letters. The neighbor raises his hand and says, yeah, I, I, I take that for 60,000, no problem. So then you tell the neighbor, well, send me the money, send me the 60,000. You, you get your 60, you pay Audrey the 30, you then keep your 30. Then you, when you record the deed, you say record this deed first, record this deed second, or you instruct the title company to do that. And then you've just made your $30,000 infinite ROI. Excellent. Yeah, I love that. So if we're talking about the second model, when you're contacting the neighbors, are you sending out neutral letters, I'm assuming? Well, as far as, what would you say? We have this property. 
make us an offer. Yeah, yeah make us an offer. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and the reason why I asked that is because I know that there's someone on this call that I've talked about this before where they actually marketed the property to the neighbors for a specific amount. And then that neighbor contacted the original owner and said, hey, did you know this? This person is making X, Y, Z on this. And that kind of killed the deal. So I like that idea of just, hey, how much would you pay for this? That's a really right. good- Yeah, absolutely. And, and then coming from the wholesaling world, you could just assign the contract as well. Absolutely. I'm a big fan of assignment, especially when you're first starting, if you're limited on resources, it's definitely a great way to get into the game. Now, yeah. I'd like to or remind- just, Or just go to a Brad and get the money. <laughs> there you go. Right? And, and that's the thing is, and really, that's really the way to think about it. It's not, how do I do this? It's who can help me do this? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so there's, and, and really the hard part of this business is getting the deal. Getting, it's not this business, any business. You get any asset, 25, 30 cents a dollar. There's money coming your way to fund that deal. There's someone else on the other end of that deal. Even if you flip for a hundred percent return. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's really good. So- Looking at how you're selecting this, these markets and how you're picking the deals and deal criteria, let's talk a little bit about what are some of your main deal breakers? If you see something that comes along, what would you say, okay, that definitely, I don't care how cheap I can get it, I'm not going to take that kind of risk. Do you have any main deal I mean, breakers? I mean, if, if you can't get to the property, that's a deal breaker. For sure. I'd say that's number one for me. Obviously... If you go to a site like epa.gov, I don't buy in areas that are going to have any type of environmental issues, but that would be a, a total deal breaker for me is an environmental issue. I'd say probate deals for me are an environmental issue. Deals are like the bus. So I don't want to spend the time and the money going through probate unless there's so much meat on that bone that it's worth it. But usually if I, I just, we're a volume business. Absolutely. So that kind of leads me into my next question beautifully in terms of being a volume business. How do you go about marketing for these deals? Are you just strictly mail? Are you text, cold call? I know there's a whole host of things out there. What are your thoughts on that? So for deal flow, we're going to look at mainly the direct mail. That's going to be our best. And we're going to get our best deal that way direct. Then the second way is wholesalers. Wholesalers are, are definitely going to be a great way for, for us to get deal flow. The third way is going to be realtors for bigger deals. And then what I call spreadsheet deals. So imagine you're a tax lien fund and you're not interested in the raw land, but because you've bought so much property in at these auctions, you're stuck with land you don't know what to do with. It's a spreadsheet deal. They're not emotionally attached. You can get deal flow that way. That's great. Can you talk us through a little bit more about the spreadsheet deals? If someone is interested in adding that arm to their acquisition department. Yeah, it's, it's literally nothing more complicated than contacting tax lien funds and just asking them what, what raw land you have available because they're not interested in the raw land. Yeah, that's a great nugget. That's excellent. And you mentioned direct mail. I'd like to drill into that a little bit. What are you finding right now to be, I know that every market is a little bit different, but on average in our industry, what are you finding to be the response rate? What is a good response rate for a, a mail campaign? And then what is the number of mailers to number of contracts that you're finding right now? Yeah. So the metrics that we're going to use are three to 5%. So if our response rate is less than 3%, we came in too low for the market. But if our response rate is higher than 5%, uh-oh. Right. Like yeah. we need to retrade during due diligence. And then out of that three to five percent, we're gonna expect to close on one percent of those deals. So for every hundred offers, one deal. Got it. That's a really clean, simple metric. So Mark, it sounds like you guys are doing blind offers, correct? So this is oh, no, we're actually sending actual offers because okay. Kendall, I can always make more money. I can't get more time. So right. I don't want to be in the appraisal business. So we'll actually send out actual offers. Got it. So can you walk us through what that process looks like? Sure. So we'll just do a little bit of math on the comparable sales, divide by four. We'll put it into our pricing matrix and our spreadsheet. We'll have a virtual assistant then put that into our spreadsheet, upload it to our software. The software then will automatically send out the offers. 
and then we'll start tracking our response rate. Excellent. Very good. But you mentioned that it's a, it's really a volume game. Have you found that there's any, with our current shifts in market, have you seen any type of trends that are affecting that volume or affecting that, those metrics in any way? We're paying more than we were. And I think that's just a, a matter of inflation. But as far as deal flow, we're steady and solid on our deal flow. And same thing with this dispositions. So from what we're personally seeing, we're not seeing any real effect. Now, I do think that as the economy inevitably needs to soften, that yeah. we will start seeing a rebalancing of our portfolio where there will be more defaults, which is fine. It lowered our cost basis and we'll just re reprice and sell that property again. But I think what we'll then see is that in a time where you've got maybe more unemployment, you've got a tighter market, a recession, it's going to be way easier to buy than it is now, but it's going to be more difficult to sell. Where right now, I would say it's a little tougher to buy in this environment, but way easier to sell. And then and then we, we can go to equilibrium where it's easy to buy, easy to sell, and then it'll continue on that sort of trajectory, if you will. Yeah. Really good insight. And so digging into the, the direct mail a little bit more. So on these actual offers that you're sending out, are you including contracts? What does your mail piece look like? It's a, it's a simple contract. Okay. And, it, and it's got a contingency so we can get out of the deal. Excellent. So they just, you're not driving into a phone call. Literally, if they want it, no. yes, we sign, move on to the next, right? 100%. Excellent. Really good. So you also mentioned wholesalers as part of your sort of acquisitions strategy deal flow arm. Can you talk a little bit about how someone might want to systemize working with wholesalers and how can they set that up versus instead of constantly scouring your email and saying, okay, that looks good. That looks good. How do you set up a system to be able to work with wholesalers at volume? I think what you do is you simply go to the communities where there's wholesalers hanging out and they got deal flow. It's really that simple. I don't think you need to do anything more advanced than just say, hey, I'm a buyer to a wholesaler. Oh, great. Right. Give them your criteria. You see the list. And I think what's more interesting is scaling the land business when we're doing volume. So 90% of our business is automated with inexpensive software, inexpensive virtual assistants. And really you want to get to the point where you're just the CEO of your land business and you're working on it and not in it. But that takes some time to build to that point. But there's, you don't really need to overcomplicate it. You could just do a quick search on Facebook, land wholesalers, and you have a plethora of people that you could start creating relationships with. And then once you've got that strong relationship, there'll be a constant source of deal flow for you. You, you will run out of money before you run out of deal flow in this business. That's excellent. That's one of the, you mentioned one of my favorite things about the land business is it is a pretty, it can be very simple. And I think that I fall into that trap, especially when I first started trying to make everything complicated. It doesn't have to be, right? That's one of the beautiful things about the land business. And you mentioned also growing and scaling. So can you talk a little bit about what your team looked like in the very beginning? And then how did you scale that out to get to where you are today? So it was just me and I was doing everything. And I was doing all the hats. And, and so it's funny because I was doing very well. And I went to lunch with my buddy, who's like, who was my first mentor. And I'm humble bragging about how well I'm doing my land business. He said, stop. He said, don't insult me. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, don't call yourself a business. I'm like, mm -hmm. what do you mean? He's like, what happens to your so-called business if you get hurt or die? I'm like, oh. Because a business is something you build that's bigger than yourself. And at that time, Steve Jobs was alive, right? He was like, if Steve Jobs dies, Apple's not going anywhere. And sure enough, you can see what happened. So after that, I'm like, well, what do I do? He's like, you need to start creating systems and processes and really have just systematically get yourself out of every single part of the business. And so it only took me five years, but I did it. And I did it kicking and screaming. 
the whole way because I thought, oh, there's no one who's going to care as much as me. There's no one who's going to do it as well as me. I was totally wrong. Yeah. So what was that? What was the very first hire for you when you started kicking and screaming and delegating some things out? Janie in South Carolina was my first hire. She was at that time, it wasn't Upwork. I forgot what the name of that site was. Maybe it was Elance.com. I found Janie in South Carolina and I sent her money to go buy envelopes and paper and the spreadsheet and here handwrite these envelopes and send out these offers. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, let's do 20 a day. That's all we need to do 20 a day. And she was my very first hire. Wow. Wow. So if someone is looking to scale their business and, and they have been doing this for quite some time, they're experiencing the burnout. They know that they need to do something to scale and to grow, get themselves a little bit out of the business what insights would you have for them just in terms of, cause a lot of it is just a lot of it, I think is like emotional and mindset block. Right. So can you talk to us about, I think, I think 90% of this business is mindset. Honestly, I think yeah, I agree. Of this out too. for sure. We have to learn how to get out of our own ways, but I would say that the first thing I would delegate is what do you hate doing the most? And for some people it's intake, right? If I had to talk to another seller, and hear their story about how they bought the land, why they bought the land, what they were planning on doing on the land, 30 minutes of the story before they said, yeah, I'll sell you the land. I, I, I was going to tear my hair out. So intake for me, once I got that off my plate, food tasted better, colors more vibrant, everything was just better. <laughs> and then from there, if I had to post another ad again, I was going to tear my hair out. I didn't want to keep posting ads. And I want to keep replying to people. So I want to get a mark, a marketing person or ad writer, as well as a sales assistant. And then finally I got an acquisition manager and have them manage the entire team. And now we have quite a team, but in the beginning, just step by step. Yeah. Hey there, land fans. If you're enjoying this episode and would like to see more episodes like this, please be sure to let us know by liking and subscribing below. Yeah, that's beautiful. I Absolutely love that. So what would you consider to be some of the most important skills to have in the land industry? Grit. Gotta have grit. And I don't even think that's even land. I think that's with any business. And sure. especially with a learning curve, right? We come in and we think, oh, we're going to be so good at this. And, it's, and you're learning a whole new set of skills and you have to have that beginner's mind. And it's like hockey, right? Like, Hockey players love hockey enough to get their teeth knocked out and then they get back up again. So do you love land enough and do you love this business enough? And can you see that this is going to be your road to freedom if you stick with it? And I think that's the only way to fail in the land business is really to quit. Yeah. So I, th I think you've got to have that skill of grit. Now there's other skills that are nice to have, but if you don't have them, there's someone else who does. And we're living the best time ever to be an entrepreneur. We have access to global talent. We have access to global intelligence. Yeah. Go to chat GPT. <laughs> write your ads. Right? Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. And, and, yeah. For all the, yeah, I would say play to your strengths, find other people to handle your weaknesses. Yeah, I really love, and again, it just speaks to that point that you just made about mindset. Grit is so important. And if you come into this thinking like, oh, it's going to be easy, I think that you've already lost the battle because it's not going to be easy. And if you expect it to be easy, some things will happen that will be very easy and some things will not. And if you say, hey, something must be wrong here. This is just doesn't work. Then you're going to be out for the count. Yeah. Look, nothing worth doing is easy. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. There's, it's a simple model. Yes. But it's not easy. Yeah. And that's a great distinction. Yeah. And so I, I always tell people that be prepared. You're going to get knocked down. That's really good. Easy is not the same as simple, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's really good. Uh, I need that on a poster somewhere in my office. Easy is not simple and vice versa. So 
You just mentioned tools and you mentioned chat GPT, that type of thing. What are some of your favorite tools or resources that you're currently using in your business or is working really well for uh, your students? Okay. So this is like a shameless plug for my software. All right. Let's hear it. All right. So I use lgpass.com, okay. which is a horrible name, the Land Geek proprietary automated software system, but it automates the whole front end of the business from mailings all the way to due diligence, to marketing, to contracts. And then, so that's like a key tool that I use. And then the other tool is managing the notes. And so we have a set and forget it automated software system called geekpay.io. So we can get the down payment, say via credit card or ACH, and then the monthly payments via ACH. And Excellent. Yeah, and if the check bounces, it could hit the credit card uh, on file as a backup, but you don't really want that. And there's lots of different reasons why. Gotcha. Mainly gotcha. you don't want to partner with Stripe at 2.9%. Mm, yeah, that all eat into it really quick. Yeah. Obviously your business model, you talked a lot about creating these notes. Let's talk a little bit about the Dispo side of that in terms of how do you actually structure the notes? You mentioned that you want to do something that makes it irresistible to people, especially in this higher interest rate sort of environment that we're in from an economic standpoint, making payments is something that's a lot more desirable for people. So yeah. how do you go about structuring these notes in a way that makes them move in 30 days? Really the pricing model, it needs to be irresistible. So it could be that if your property is not selling in 30 days, something has to change. And you need to isolate that variable. Maybe it's your headline. You're just not getting enough clicks. And so you need to know your metrics on that. So I know if I get three leads on land.com, I should get a sale. If I don't get a sale, I've got a sales problem. I don't have a marketing problem. If I'm getting 40 to 50 leads, on Facebook and I'm not getting a sale, then I've got a selling problem. If I'm only getting 10 leads on Facebook, I have a marketing problem. So what's my problem? Is it my headline? Is it my pricing? Maybe my price is too low and people think oh, there's something wrong with the property. Ooh. Maybe the down payment's too high. Maybe the monthly payment's too high. So I want to isolate these variables and test it. But typically when we get our yield calculator out, that's how we're going to set up essentially the financing because we want to make sure we're typically at a, a minimum yield of 72%. Got it. So you made a really interesting distinction between is it a marketing problem is it a sales problem. How do you go about isolating? Do you split test? Do you split test headlines? What do you do? How do you, let's say a property is not moving and you have to start troubleshooting. Where's the first place that you go to? Yeah, you absolutely want to either split test or just create a new ad and see, okay, this ad that we had running for say 30 days gave us this many leads. Now I'm gonna isolate two variables, right? Because I think when I'm looking at the market and I'm seeing that, oh, Kendall sold his property. What was he doing differently than me? Oh, he had a way better headline than me. And he got way more clicks, right? Or his pricing was just better. He had a lower down payment. I'll lower the payment, down payment. So I'll, I'll check out, the, those are like the first two variables I would change and then split test. Now that second ad doesn't beat the first ad and I'm 60 days in, then now I have to reevaluate some other variables. And maybe it's the total price of the property. Maybe it's my pictures. Something's not resonating with the market. You're never gonna outsmart the market. Just give the market what it wants. I like to say, I've, I've had a very just brilliant mentor tell me when I first started in, in, in the real estate business is that a property is worth how, however much the market is willing to pay for that property. Otherwise, you can say, hey, it, it's worth this all day. But if no one's willing to pay that, then that's, that means it's, that's not what it's worth. So getting information from the market is so important. Yeah, you'll see newbies come into this and they'll look at, they'll think about themselves oh, I need this property to sell for this price so that I solve my financial problem. Market doesn't care about your financial problem. So yes. it's always about them. It's never about you. And the market can, can sense it when it's about you.
Yeah, that's a good one. That, that's a good nugget for sure. So you mentioned yield earlier. Can you walk us through what some of your, like your other criteria are when you're putting together terms? Is there like a, a length of time that you have to have or that you like to have? What are your rules of thumb when you're putting together a structure? I, I, re- I, I really don't. It's really just yield is all we're looking at. Yeah, okay. because less expensive properties are going to have a lower or shorter term. But let's say for easy numbers, for every $1,000 I invest, then I want my monthly payment to be 100 a month. Got it. Very good. So if someone is maybe not new to the land space, they're used to flipping for cash and they say, you know what, with this market, I've got to get into the notes game. I've got to create some passive flow, cash flow, but they have no idea about how to structure this or how to structure that when it comes to notes. They don't know if it should be a 36 month note or an 18 month note. Like what are some pointers that you can give to them in that regard? I, I, again, I think the, the best pointer is really getting your capital out fast and then just seeing what does the market want. Again, it's not gonna be about you. It's give the market what they want, make it irresistible, make it a car payment. What's the, what's, look at the cars, right? What's the most popular car in the United States? What does it sell for? Well, why is that? Because anybody with a job can afford it. That's, that's really good. That's really what you want to look at. Excellent. Yeah, really nice. You mentioned neighbors contacting buyers list, craigslistland.com. Can you dig in a little bit more to your dispo process? Do you actually have outreach outside of just posting ads or how do you go about like your disposition process? Yeah. So again, it's just going to be like that marketing algorithm that we talked about. Neighbors, buyers list, then the lands, Facebook, Craigslist, free platforms or inexpensive platforms to to market the property on. Very good. Very good. If someone is brand new to the space, brand new to land, brand new to real estate, what would you say are some of the most important daily needle moving activities that they need to do every single day in order to start getting some traction and start doing deals? Yeah, I would buy a box of M&Ms. I wouldn't eat the M&Ms because it's got a lot of sugar, but the M&M stands for mailing and marketing. That's what this business is. Never stop your deal flow. Never stop mailing. Never stop looking for your deals. If you have run out of money, call Brad. <laughs> there you go. Right? Don't let the money problem stop you. Because in this business, again, we're making our money on the buy. So M&M, mailing and marketing. That's good. Really good. So you've dealt with thousands of students in, in your career so far. What are some of the most common things that you've seen people overlook or underestimate when they first get started in the land business? It's just what we were talking about. They buy a piece of property, they Mm -hmm. stop mailing because they don't want to invest any more money in any more land, any more deal flow until they sell that property. Mm -hmm. It's a six week cycle. Now you've just lost six weeks of deal flow because you stopped your mailing. So I'd say that is the biggest newbie mistake is just not having faith. In, in themselves or the model. Yeah, I love that. The Putting it in terms of time, six week cycle. So if you stop mailing, you're essentially like your pump is no longer primed. It's gonna take you an additional six weeks to get exactly. anything rolling again. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. a really good point. Really good yeah. point. And, and think about it from your anchor, right? You just bought a property 25, 30 cents a dollar. You've stopped your deal flow. And now you're like, oh, I'll just go to the wholesale market. Now you're like, wait, I got to buy this 50 cents on the dollar. And you got spoiled. Ah, So don't stop. Don't stop the mailings. That's really good. When in doubt, mail it out, right? You just got to keep mailing. So in your opinion, what is something that no one or very few people are talking about in the land industry right now that we should be talking about? No one's ever asked me that question. I feel honored. (laughs) what should we be talking about i think the i think it's it's, to me it's 
what problem is this solving for you? It's like for me, I want to help people solve not just their money problems, but also their time problems. And I think cash flow and passive income solves both. And what's interesting to me is when I hear people that want to get into the land business and they've just created another job for themselves. And they're constantly having to chase the next deal because they flipped it for cash. And look, there's nothing wrong with cash, but it's not as great as housing because you got no tax advantages. So unless you're going to flip out in a self-directed vehicle, like an IRA or a Roth or a SEP, I think it's just better to really sell in in on easy terms, build up that note income. If you need to sell a note for cash, great, no problem. The math works beautifully for that. So I, I would say that really do some soul searching on what's your, why do you want to do this? If if everything is, it's a simple model, but if, if I'm going to do something that's not easy, why am I doing this? What problem is it going to solve for me? And there's nothing wrong if you have a money problem, solving your money problem with a cash sale. But I think thinking long-term, if you want to move up Maslow's hierarchy of needs in self-actualization and what your really true purpose is in life, solve not just your money problems, but solve your time problems. So you have the the time and the energy and the resources to live your best life. That's really good. That's fantastic stuff right there. So we uh, mentioned a little earlier about resources and tools, hinted at AI a little bit. Are you currently using AI in your business? Every day. And honestly, you have to be doing it every day. The technology is changing so fast. It's a, you have to be on top of it. Now, that's not to say that I'm going in and learning Python or LLMs and these large language models, but I'm keeping up my, I'm sending it to my team, right? Hey, have you seen this? Have you seen that? Again, I can always make more money. I can't get more time. So anything that's going to save my team time, myself time, I want to be on top of it, but it's changing so quickly. So I just want to be very cognizant that all these new startups, 90% of them are probably not going to be around. And so let's, I, I think chat GPT is going to be around. I think they're doing a really good job. They're backed by Microsoft. So let's learn that really well. And one of the biggest mistakes I see people make when they're using ChatGPT for the first time is they start, they write, they say, write me an ad for this property, five acres in Colorado. And it writes an ad, a slice of heaven. Every time I see a slice, <laughs> I know ChatGPT wrote that headline. Right. So you need to give it context and you need to spend a little bit of a time with it. I would treat ChatGPT like a, a, a good intern. And a good intern needs training. Give them the context. Talk to them about, this is my avatar. This is the business I'm in. This is how I want to write. Write it like a combination of Vonnegut and Ryan Reynolds. Make it a little bit more fun and keep editing it before you ship that work. So I think that's one of the biggest mistakes is people think, oh, this is great. AI wrote it. Don't just check the box off. Is it an effective ad? Yeah, that's really good. You mentioned ads. Is there any other cool uses for AI that you're using in your business right now? I think we're constantly testing things. I'd say that I wouldn't at this point in time give any recommendations because nothing besides ChatGPT, I wouldn't recommend anything. I think what's more interesting to me is the automations of a Zapier. Uh, maybe Airtable, Follow Up Boss. Those are some really interesting tools uh, for our business that we use. But as far as AI is concerned, we're constantly testing and experimenting with all these things. And I just was, I just did a text to video like test today. Like it, you just write the text and say, I've got this land and it makes a video and it created a TikTok video for you and a YouTube video and Instagram. I was like, but it was terrible. So, <laughs> but it, but right, right. it's terrible now. And maybe the prompt was terrible. So I, I would say that you, you definitely want to keep testing and get geeky with these tools, knowing that they're going to be way better in the future and that you're in the right space because your labor costs are going to go down. Everything's just going to get so much better and easier 
cheaper, faster. And right. if you're not an entrepreneur, what are you going to do? Yeah. That being said, I guess you could blue collar work is going <laughs> to come back. Right. Yeah. The robots aren't coming back for that. But other than that, yeah. Yeah. If I'm a copywriter, I'd be nervous right now. Well, and that is one of the cool things, in my opinion, about like testing out AI is I may not find a tool that like meets exactly what needs I have, but it, it at least gets me thinking about what needs would I have if I had an AI solution to this? That way I can be on the lookout for that type of thing. And as soon as I find something, I'm able to plug it into my business a lot faster versus, okay, here's a cool tool. Now, how could I use it? You're using the tool to actually solve problems. Yeah, exactly. I, I love the way you said that. Yeah. Find the problem first, then find the tool. Excellent. So talk to us about what do you consider to be your superpower? So I, I think it's my birth, my best quality. My worst quality is my patience. Ah, I have a tremendous amount of patience and, and I can think long-term. So day to day, I'm pretty, I've got, I'm pretty calm. That being said, I could be too patient. And then things build up and I'm like, and then I'm like, wait, what just happened? Why was I so patient with this? <laughs> so I, I would say that patience is, is probably my superpower. Love that. Yeah. Oftentimes our superpowers can be double-edged swords for sure, but yeah. that's a good one. Patience is a good one, especially in this game. And especially when it is all about sticking it out and not quitting. Yeah. And that's the other thing is like in that focus, right? Like I'm an inch wide and a mile deep. I, for 23 years now, I've only done land and and just kept my focus with it because yeah, everything else looks sexy, but I have no advantage in it. So the longer I do this, the it just keeps compounding and compounding. And I get a little bit better. And my team gets a little bit better every year, just a one percent better every year and compounds. And all of a sudden, we're really good at this now. I really like how you said that, that you have no advantage in it. I know as an entrepreneur. I have and constantly am fighting the shiny object syndrome, right? Oh my gosh, this looks amazing. Oh, think about the opportunities with this and the possibilities with that, especially if you're a visionary, right? Like you're always constantly, oh, that's a cool idea. Let me build a business around it. But I love that litmus test that you just mentioned about, I have no advantage in it. Yes, it's a cool model, but do I have an advantage? What will that learning curve be like if I do decide to go all in on that? So that's a really good way to put it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's like you want to build a bridge and it's brick by brick. But if you build half the bridge and they go to another bridge, you start over again. <laughs> yeah. Complete the bridge. For sure. For sure. Yeah, that's good. What's your definition of success? My def definition of success would be you, you're waking up with enthusiasm every single day, right? For life. And you're serving a purpose bigger than yourself. There's a great book by David Brooks called The Second Mountain. And so let's say the first mountain is egoic, right? Your parents tell you, get a good education, get a good job. You get the house, you get the car, you get, you climb the mountain if you're lucky and you're, you get to the top of that mountain and it's like empty because it's all about you. And then you go to the second mountain and it's all about your relationships. It's about community. It's about your faith, your spirituality. It's um, about serving, right? It's a tougher mountain to climb but it's way more fulfilling. And I think for me, success is, you know, can I be that pond in the pebble, uh, or that pebble in the pond, a little dyslexic, right? And, and can I have an impact and can it ripple out in every area of my life, right? It doesn't just have to be business. Or am, am I improving my relationships, right? And, and really at the end of it, I'm gonna lose everyone and everything. And on my deathbed, am I gonna be a good ancestor? Did I live with integrity to live my values? Did I make any impact on the world in a positive way? And I think that's, for me, success. And then can I transcend money? Can I do all the things that money can't buy? Can I have a fit body, right? I can't pay someone to do my push-ups for me, like you, Kendall, right? <laughs> can, I, can I have a calm mind? Can Things are going to happen in life. Can I keep my equanimity? Can I have a house full of love? And I think if I can really work on those things, um, at the end of it, I'll, I'll feel like I was a, a success. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. In your experience working with students, what have you found is the key 
differentiator between students that are ultra successful and students that kind of have some success and then fizzle out. Grit. There you go. It's all about grit. All about the grit. Yeah. That's really, that's the differentiator, honestly. Like on a long enough timeline, everyone gets paid in this business. Can you stick it out? That's it. Yeah, I love that. And can you take a punch, right? Because I think that's an important part of grit is it's not just, yeah, just staying it long. Realize like you will be hit really hard sometimes. And can you continue staying in after those hits, right? Yeah, 100%. I mean, can you manage your emotions? It's hard. It's like you're in a business and your money's going out. You have no money coming in. And you go on YouTube and you're like, wait a second. Alex Ramosi's doing this. Gary <laughs> doing that. Grant Cardone's doing that. Everyone's killing it doing that. And you're off to the next thing. And you're like, oh my God, that's hard too. Everything's hard in the beginning. Yeah. Pick your hard. Choose your hard. Love that. Love it. So... You mentioned Hermosi, you mentioned Grant Cardone. Who are some of your favorite entrepreneurs, business owners, thought leaders that you like to read, follow, watch their content? I like Simon Sinek. I like Adam Grant. I, I like Naval Ravikant. Tim Ferriss' podcast, I think, is phenomenal. Yeah. Anything by Morgan Housel. I love Morgan Housel. I like the way that guy just thinks and speaks. And uh, He's got a podcast now that's out. I would say that Alex Ramosi is great. I love his content as well. Sharon Srivatsa, the Business School podcast, he's great. I'm trying to think who else do I like? Wealth Without Wall Street, the, the wow. Slow Talkers, Russ Morgan, Joey Murray. Those guys are great. I'd say there's there's no reason now we can't, we have access to so much information. It's like the information's abundant. Great information's abundant. I think what's scarce is the will to just go deep on it and have that focus and have that patience. Okay, these two people I'm really going to go deep on. I'd rather read a hundred of the greatest books than read a book every month, Ty Lopez, that's not going to stick. <laughs> right? I want to read the same great books for the longest time and really master those concepts and, and get really good at something, have competence in something. Yeah, that's really good advice. Coming from, I, I'm, I'm interested in now that we are, I realize that we are speaking to a focus Jedi here. Can you talk to us about if someone is listening to all the podcasts, looking at all of the, watching all the YouTube videos, reading all the books, doing all of the things we've mentioned, you just mentioned that there's so much information. It can be overwhelming sometimes. What advice would you have for someone that just feels overwhelmed and they don't know where to start because they have all of this information, how do they just get going on a path and get traction? I would just read two books. These two books will, will, will literally change your life and just do that. So just read The One Thing by Gary Keller and Jay Papazan and The 12 Week Year by Brian Moran. If you execute on those two books, it'll move the needle. Awesome. Love that. If you could go back and tell yourself three pieces of advice when you were first starting in the land business, what would they be? Build a business, number one. Outsource, delegate, automate. That'd be my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is if you wouldn't work with that person for ever, don't work with them for a day. Mm -hmm. And my third piece of advice would be learn to meditate because you want to keep a calm mind, a calm head, and stay present, right? If we're constantly letting our emotions run wild because of the past or the future, we're going to miss it all. I think meditation can, can really make life so much more uh, enjoyable when you get that skill. What's the best? Say again, takes time. Yeah. So it's, it's worth it. It's worth it. For those of us who just have a thousand thoughts in our head constantly. And from the time we wake up to the time we go to bed, obviously meditation is a really fantastic practice, but how would you suggest someone who may have resistance to meditation may have resistance to just sitting still? What type of advice would you have for them? And just how can, how can they get I would say do breath work? I think breath work is like 
breathwork is to meditation as pickleball is to tennis. So it's way easier. You're going to get a way bigger bang for your buck in the, in the, in the beginning with breathwork than you will meditation. So I'd start there. But if you want more, a less woo answer, tactically speaking, really just what are you good at? Go to your, play to your strengths and keep working on it. Very good. What's the biggest surprise you've had so far on your journey into the land space? That the margins have stayed where they are. I remember in 2001, and we we're making 300 to a thousand percent on these deals. And I remember saying to my buddy, at the end of the day, there's people are going to come into this. This is going to be a 30% gross margin business. That was 22 years ago. And sure enough, the margins have stayed still inefficient. That's quite the surprise. Very good. What's your biggest passion or goal you'd like to achieve at this point in your life? Yeah, again, being a, being a good ancestor, I think, is the goal for me. Yeah, I really love how you say that, being a good ancestor. That's, that's a lot. There's a lot of weight in that, for sure. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah. I just want to thank you so much. You've given us so much fantastic information, so many wonderful insights. How can we give back to you right now? What kind of connections or resources are you looking for currently? As far as connections or resources, if you've got deal flow, email me. Excellent. Uh, how, do they, how do we reach out to you? How do we Oh, yeah. Them? Yeah. Uh, you can just email mark at thelandgeek.com. And if you're interested in learning more about what I do and how I do it, I would say I could put, you know, I think there's a link. Let me see. It's You can get Dirt Rich, my book, for free. I think it's free, but you got, you got to pay for the shipping. I could have a link to that. We'll put it in the show notes. That way everyone can have access to it. So Mark, what types of, you just mentioned that you're looking to do some deal flow with people. Really fast, quick list of your criteria. What types of deals someone has a deal and they say, this might be a good Mark deal. What are you looking for? I'm, I'm opportunistic. So I just want a good deal. Got it. So large subdivides are okay. Large subdivides are great. Absolutely. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. As Very long, good. As, as long as there's, there's meat on that bone. <laughs> awesome. We'll, we'll take a look at it. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much. I want to thank you, Mark, for, for sharing so much of your, your wisdom and knowledge with us today. Thank you everyone for joining. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, take care, be safe, and we'll catch you in the next one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they built and run their businesses, then check out my group, Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.